The grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's text is Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Please be seated. Show of hands. How many people is this the very, 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 very first time they have ever heard this parable? Hard to find a parable that is better known than the prodigal son. Am I not right? And so how many of you have never, ever, ever heard a sermon on the prodigal son? Okay. With this survey just now completed, I have this caveat for the message. Don't expect to hear a whole lot of new things. But it is good to hear the same old truths again because we need to be reminded of them frequently. The story, of course, is misnamed. The name prodigal son focuses on only one of the three main characters. It overlooks the oldest son and it overlooks the father. I personally prefer the name Jesus gave it, a man who had two sons. The second problem comes with the traditional description of the youngest son who is identified as the prodigal. Now the word prodigal means something like wasteful, spendthrift, reckless, excessive, careless, and so on. But it doesn't mean you're morally bankrupt. It just means that you really don't know what you're doing with your money. Okay, now this might indicate wild parties and prostitutes and the like, but it doesn't have to. The idea that the youngest son wasted his inheritance in loose living comes from the self-righteous older brother, not from the lips of Jesus. And that older brother is not the hero of the story, nor is he a role model for us. The youngest son could have just as easily wasted his money in a series of reckless, stupid, foolish business deals, spending his money, again, recklessly or wastefully, on one grand idea after the other, which did not pan out. And I'm willing to bet that you know of at least one person who is always looking for that next big score and losing money time and time again. Of course, I'll never get the name A Man Who Had Two Sons implanted in the popular psyche, but for us today, as we take a closer look at this parable, we should remember that the son who leaves home is not the star of the story, nor is the son who stayed home. In reality, the father is the star of the story. And that is worth keeping in our mind. The story is set in a typical first century Jewish uh, community, town, village. The father is well off and well respected in the community. Uh, just in case you want to know, I can always get louder than any child. <laughs> uh, Though he is a good and loving father, he, is still, he still has family problems, right? The examples of good parents having problems with their children could be multiplied many, many times, including many times out of the Bible. In the Garden of Eden, God situates his children, Adam and Eve, in paradise. They could not have had a better father who provided them with everything that they needed. But they turned their back on the Lord. Then Adam and Eve experienced the very same problem when one of their sons, Cain, actually murders his brother. The families of the patriarchs certainly are an example of turmoil. Good parents with wayward children are still with us. How many of you know of at least one couple that you would have called good parents, and their children went the wrong direction. Yeah, the problem is still with us. So this story feels very believable. 
Now, the general rule of thumb is that a person receives their inheritance when the testator dies. When the testator lives, the property is theirs to do with as they please. Sell it, give it away, whatever they want. It's their property. It does not belong to the children or anyone else that might be named in the will. When the youngest son asks for his inheritance, everyone in Jesus' congregation would have been shocked by the audacity of the request. It was equivalent to the boy saying to his father, I wish you were dead so that I had your, my inheritance already. After all, it is really mine. It wasn't. In fact, it was still his father's. But that is how he felt. That property, that money is really mine. The next shock in the story is that the father agrees to the request. Now, there is only one real reason the father would do this, and that is because he loved the boy. He loved the son so selflessly that he decides to grant the request. Maybe the son will act responsibly with the inheritance. Wouldn't that be great? The father will at least Give him the chance. The hearers of Jesus' story would have been surprised if the youngest son left, did not leave town. With his request, he dishonored his father and estranged himself from the whole village. The towns and villages in Galilee and Judea were close-knit, and everyone would have thought that this boy had shamed his father. And they would have thought correctly based on the uh, context. There would have been few, if any, who would have wanted to associate with this boy. The far country was a Gentile country. We know that because pig herding was a going uh, business and that would never have happened in a Jewish setting because pigs were unclean. Being a Gentile city, obviously, the people that the boy had available to associate with were Gentiles. So it seems likely that he also turned his back on his religious upbringing. A severe famine comes to the land with all the uh, economic upheaval that that brings with it. The boy lost all his money in such reckless ways that almost no one was willing to help him when he fell on hard times. Having gotten a job looking after unclean pigs and nearly starving to death, he finally comes to his senses. He repents of his many sins and he identifies the chief sin and he identifies it correctly as sinning against his father. While, of course, that's obvious from the story, there is an important point here for us. All our sins are chiefly against God, our Heavenly Father. Another point you have probably heard preached on many times, but still needs to be said, is that the youngest son represents those who are outside the church. They may have been born into a church-going family, but they have left. They have followed the way of the world. They value what the world values. They follow the latest trends. The second son, the son that stays at home, represents those who are good, lifelong church members. You might think that he then would be the star of the story, but he isn't. He is just as misguided as the youngest son, and we'll get to that in just a minute. As I said, the youngest son repents of his sin. It seems memory plays an important part in this repentance, just as important as the hard times that fell on him. Never, ever, ever sell short the value of memory work and time spent in service in the Lord. If someone wanders from the faith, and they're not going to pick up a Bible then, are they? 
They're not going to turn on a Christian radio station, are they? They're not going to listen to a Christian podcast, are they? But what can they never get rid of? What they got tucked away in their memory. And if you have John 3, 16 and all those other great passages memorized, the Holy Spirit can use that. Use that word that you have in your memory to bring a person back to faith. Yes, circumstances like hard times can be used by the Lord too. But the word that you hammer in your head when you're 5, 10, 15 is still with you when you're 50, 60, or 70. Now, the youngest son sets off to return, hoping that he might work his way back into his father's good graces. This plan conforms to standard human reasoning. God's expansive grace does not make sense to fallen human reason. The standard thinking is that you get what you pay for. You get what you deserve. There is no such thing as a free lunch. And this boy is not counting on that free lunch. The people listening to the story the first time would have agreed with this youngest son. It was a good plan. Here comes the next big shock in the story. The father sees the son a long way off. Instead of being angry with the boy, he has compassion on him. He runs to the boy and embraces him. In the first century, a man of this stature would not run, period. He might have walked in a stately way there, but he certainly would not have run. Women were allowed to run, by the way. So if that was his mom, everybody would have said, yeah, but, you know, that's a woman. She gets excited. She runs. She's happy. Dad's stoic. They don't do that sort of mushy stuff. So, you know, anyways. <laughs> he was not... It was not being seemly what the man was doing. But what he probably would have done is just stood still, made the boy take that long, humiliating walk towards the father, always running around in his mind what he was going to say and hoping, hoping that his father would not say something like, you have your inheritance. I'm dead to you. What claim do you have here? Why have you come back? Then the boy would probably grovel a bit and hope against hope that his father had some speck of affection that would allow him to be a servant. Our text says servant. The Greek says slave. A servant in the father's house where he was once a son. But his father is a different kind of father. Our Heavenly Father is a different kind of father. He loves this son. He runs to him like a fool would run. Think, think in your mind now the most respectable person you can, the most respectable man. And imagine him running with his arms flailing down the road. Would you ever see that? That surprise image is what the people that listened to Jesus would have had in their mind as well. And so that gives you a glimpse of what they were thinking. The father breaks all protocol when he runs to his son, embraces him, and gives him gifts befitting a son and throws a party. Now, one of the roles of the eldest son in first century Palestine in that con context was to preside over all the parties given by the father so that the father would be free to mingle with the guests. As soon as the elder son heard that his father was throwing a party, he should have swung into high gear, but instead he stands outside like a petulant child. He is angry 
and refuses to go into the party, let alone accept his traditional responsibilities. When his father comes out to him, the eldest son speaks rudely to his dad. Though this son never left town, nor did he ask for his inheritance early, his every action and word reveals that he also does not consider the estate belonging to his father, but actually his. Any party should be for guests he approved, and that certainly did not include the youngest son, his brother. Those who he does not approve would not be invited. Those listening to Jesus that day would have been just as shocked by this eldest brother's actions as they were shocked by the youngest son's action. The father pleads with the boy to rejoice with him. He even gives the reason. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The boy, though, has a list of reasons to be disrespectful and disobedient to his father and nurse anger and hatred towards his brother. This bitterness and resentment keeps him outside the party, outside the church. The father is no happier about this than he was with the younger son who left town. The father loves the elder son and wants him to come to the party. Now let us consider some lessons. First, the hero is clearly the father. He has a heroic love. This love goes above and beyond what we expect for both sons. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people gripe about the love of God. How could God love this, that, or the other person? I, I, one of my earliest memories of this sort of experience was a man who griped about Johnny Cash when he became a Christian. A person, in his opinion, who had lived the life that Johnny Cash had lived, had no business becoming a Christian or calling himself a Christian. Years later, when Bob Dylan became a Christian, I heard a song by a contemporary Christian music singer griping about Bob Dylan and how Bob Dylan wasn't living up to this particular person's standards. The parable today teaches that the father embraces Johnny Cash, Bob Dylan, and their critics. If they don't enter the party, it's not because they weren't invited. The next thing we learn is that we all are sinners. It doesn't matter if we are inside the church or outside, whether we're the older brother or the younger brother. The older son demonstrates the sin of pride. The list of Bible passages that condemn this sin is monumental. He feels he is better than his father, that his opinion is better than his father's, but he is fatally wrong in both cases. The youngest son despises his father's provisions, his good gifts, and uses them recklessly. God gives us many good gifts beyond price, things like the Bible, which many people hardly ever read. The Lord's Supper, which many scarcely spend a minute in preparing for. Baptism, which many view as nothing more than a ceremony that happened long, long time ago. He also gives us his church in which we receive his gifts of mercy, forgiveness, strength, understanding, and so much more. Through such gifts, through such means, the Holy Spirit grants eternal life. So the son, youngest son walks away from the grace of the Father. Sin is all about us. What tempts one person doesn't necessarily tempt another. But just because some of your sins are not the same sins as mine doesn't mean that I do not sin. Just because the sin of the oldest son is different from the sin of the younger son does not mean the eldest had no sin. 
The next thing, and the last thing we will consider today, is that God loves all, and we are called to do the same. This love is manifest in a desire to see all come to the feast, which represents the church both here on earth and hereafter in eternity. God desires the salvation of all. As Paul told Timothy, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It doesn't matter where someone is from, how much money they make, who their parents are, or what kind of mistakes they have made in their past. The Father loves them and wants them to come to faith in Jesus and join a church that proclaims his love. Just as he once said about us, you were once dead, but now alive, once lost, but now found, he desires to say the same for all our neighbors, friends, relatives, people in Chestnut Hill states, and so forth. May we remember that we were once lost, but now are found, and understand that reaching out with God's love in Christ Jesus is what we are called to do, just as the Father told the eldest son to do. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.